Imagine yourself in 17th century England. You're a politician, a member of parliament, a parliament which is becoming more and more at odds with the king, and eventually a point of no return is reached. A civil war is coming. Everyone needs to pick a side and gather troops to fight for that side, yourself included. And despite not having any military experience whatsoever, you end up raising some of the best soldiers in the entire conflict. Not only that, but nearly every battle you fight in, you command them to victory. And eventually, you forge an entire army, one that is highly trained and highly disciplined, something unlike anything ever seen in the country before. Using this new model army, you lead your side to victory and cement yourself as history's most underrated general. Hello? And welcome back to another episode of History's Most... History's Most Underrated General. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and today we are excitingly, I think, for the first time covering the period that is sometimes referred to as uh, the kind of horse and musket period of warfare. Mm -hmm. Um... I know we did obviously do an episode about the French Revolution, but we didn't really talk about warfare very much. Um, and there was a bit of um, a bit of Brit bashing in that one. <laughs> so it's time to uh, to put the English back on their pedestal today. <laughs> Indeed. For today, we are going to be talking about Oliver Cromwell. Ah, uh, yes. I think this, uh, you know, I think this would blindside a few people if they're thinking about great generals from history. Hmm. Um, I mean, he has a remarkable story, doesn't he? Because it comes out of it comes out of nowhere. Absolutely. Um, one of the things with Oliver Cromwell uh, is that he's not really known as a general. Yeah. And most of his career, he wasn't a soldier. And yet, he does end up, you know, campaigning for over a decade and doing a, well, a miraculously good job as a general. Yeah. It's kind of surprising when you consider that he had no military experience whatsoever. I mean, his military service just kind of came out of the blue, didn't it? He, yeah, he learned the lessons of war while fighting war um if we think about kind of great generals you know if we're thinking about the last 200 years most of them have been in the military as from cadets from an early age you know joined in their maybe teens gone through military kind of training risen through the ranks and become um you know fantastic generals in in professional armies, if you like. Um, if you think further back in time, ancient or medieval times, many of the generals were usually kind of from the ruling family or a royal family. Yeah. Uh, so what they had, they might not have had professional military training in that sense, but they would have been born and raised from an early age to have the expectation of leading uh, an army, mm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a medieval prince, the heir to a throne, your youth is going to be spent in part, you know, learning to fight, learning to ride a horse. You know, if you think about the activities of a medieval nobleman, the leisure activities, you know, jousting, tournaments, hunting, archery, horse riding, you're kind of, the, you're being... You have the basics of you know, that type of warfare to an extent. You know, it's not warfare, but you have the basics there. I, I would say it's almost like a martial background. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, the same could be said for many kind of leaders in ancient times. You think about, I think, um, 
some of the people we've interviewed have said Alexander the Great as a, one of the great generals mm. of history. And his father um, was a great general and he'd been on campaign with him, you know, several times before Alexander the Great took the reins. So a lot of the great generals from history, unsurprisingly, have a military background. Yeah. Um, but the same cannot be said for Oliver Cromwell. This is where the underrated part comes in. Because Oliver Cromwell was... Well, he was born in, in what, 1599? Um, mm -hmm. And, I mean, not I know not much is really known about his super early life. But, as it stood, he came from a from a very downtrodden upbringing, didn't he? He was a member of very much um, the kind of provincial gentry. He was not a from a prestigious family. He was a distant relative of uh, Thomas Cromwell, who had been one of the chief ministers of Henry VIII, who had been from a very poor background and risen up. Um, but Oliver Cromwell was from a fairly impoverished kind of gen um uh, gentleman's background in the sense that he, he his family were kind of local landowners in a town called Huntingdon in Cambridgeshire but it was a bit of a provincial backwater mm. um, he was not a member of the aristocracy he we don't really know that like you said we don't know that much about his early life he was at Cambridge University for a while studying law although I think uh, I believe I'm right in saying we don't believe he finished his studies um, he got into a dispute about his lands. He was elected to Parliament uh, for Huntingdon in 1628. But we know of only one minor speech he made at that time. The only really significant event in his life before we get to his storied career in the English Civil War um, was that sometime, and we don't even know when, sometime in the 1630s, he underwent a religious conversion and became a dedicated Puritan, an extreme um, brand of Protestant Christianity, which sought to strip away almost all aspects of um, the kind of Catholic and establishment versions of Christianity and was really about focused on the individual's uh, personal connection with God. And that faith was extremely strong and important in Oliver Cromwell's career. But he again became an MP, this time for Cambridge in the 1640s. Um, but even then, he wasn't an important member of Parliament. He wasn't a significant player in the events that led to the English Civil War. So he really did come out of nowhere, if you like. Hmm. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was I, now. I'm curious now. How did he? Because you know, we were saying like you know, he came from a relatively kind of impoverished background. How did he enter politics? Because it sounds like it just kind of happened. Yeah. Again, um, he was probably involved in the local government of Huntington as one of the local you know notables mm. in the sense that you know he was a landowner. Right. Um, he wasn't a wealthy landowner uh, and he probably struggled financially to maintain his estate. Um, but as a landowner, that gave you the right to vote and the right to stand for parliament. Um, and perhaps as well, his legal training, whatever it may have been, stood him in some sort of stead to to be chosen as first Huntingdon and then Cambridge's member of parliament um but like i said he wasn't considered a significant figure until the civil war started um do you think it's worth going a quick pricey of of the english civil war how it started how it broke out sure i know it's quite an obscure topic maybe even for people in the uk um but the first English Civil War, there was three, um, and they're sometimes called the War of the Three Kingdoms because they didn't just take place in England. Um, but conflict started in 1642 because there'd been a long-running dispute basically over power, money, um, and to some extent religion between the English Parliament and the King, Charles I. 
Um, Charles had actually closed down Parliament throughout the 1630s in what was known as the 11-year tyranny um, and ruled by himself. It was a personal monarchy. But he'd had increasing problems with rebellions in both Scotland and Ireland, largely um, religious, uh, religiously um, inspired rebellions. And that meant he needed money to raise an army to fight these rebels because the King of England was also at that time King of Scotland and Ireland. But Parliament was in no mood to grant him taxes mm -hmm. and basically attached a whole string of conditions about massively increasing Parliament's power if they were to grant him the taxes he so desperately needed. And eventually it got to the point where the King was trying to arrest members of Parliament Parliament was making demands about um, sacking certain ministers of the government, which was at that time still very much the king's domain. And Parliament was also seeking to take control of the Church of England. And so the position between the two eventually got to the point where Charles raised an army in Oxford and Parliament rapidly raised an army from London. And that's where Oliver Cromwell comes in, because there wasn't a British army or an English army at that point. Hmm. So when the war started, each side, both the leaders of each side, but also any noble or member of the gentry, picked sides and then raised a unit themselves, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Almost like a medieval knight or, or nobleman would do, they raise a unit or an army um, within their own lands. So they recruit from the local population. Hmm. And that's exactly what Oliver Cromwell did. He raised a troop of horse of cavalrymen in Huntingdon. And um, straight away, he kind of set himself apart because while everyone else is kind of scrabbling around for manpower, Oliver Cromwell, who's never had any military experience before, um, is looking for something in particular. Um, when he's raising his troop of horse. Um, he wants men who are going to be uh, committed to the cause. And uh, in his own words, men who had the fear of God before them and made some conscience of what they did. So he wanted religious men as yeah. well. He wanted, you know, particularly kind of people who shared his Puritan um faith and he raised this troop of local horse from cambridgeshire who were kind of dedicated professional i'll put in very loose inverted commas um and, and not just either people who kind of been pressed into it or soldiers of fortune but he wants dedicated uh, god-fearing men in his little band of of, of horsemen hmm yeah, that kind of that really does set him apart from everyone else, doesn't it? It does, and um, he really put an emphasis on discipline, on um, like I've said, religion, and the idea that that not just would affect their personal conduct, but also on the battlefield. Um, it was really kind of imbued in Cromwell's view that this would make them more determined soldiers more dedicated soldiers, but also saw soldiers who would follow orders and would would you'd be able to kind of control them on the battlefield. Yeah. A Cromwell, I think we uh, we should mention, is very, throughout his career will be very fiercely guided by uh, by God. Um, and Absolutely. He, he no, said that... No different um, on the battlefield. Yeah, he said, a few honest men are better than numbers. Uh, if you choose godly, honest men, honest men will follow them. And, and, and you've got to put yourself in the worldview. Again, we talked about in the Crusades episodes, mm. didn't we, of, of understanding the worldview of people at that time. And look, the 17th century was a kind of almost hyper-religious period um, in the wake of the Reformation and new ideas about, you know, Puritanism, for example. And if you believe that God manifests himself on earth and controls the kind of fate of man, then it makes sense that you want godly soldiers because then God is going to be on your side. Hmm. And so he really does 
carry the this 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 air of of fierce religiosity. Is that a word? If it's not, it is yeah, one it is. now. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, but good. Uh, into some no, of the the first battles of the. Uh... Yeah, the first big battle of the Civil War is called the Battle of Edge Hill, uh, where the King's army was marching on London, and Parliament's army came out to stop them. Now, Cromwell's troop of horse was actually late to the battle and they missed the fighting. But he heard about what happened. Um, and he heard that basically the horse, the cavalry, which usually sat on the flanks of the army, you know, you'd have the infantry in the center and you'd have your cavalry on each flank. The royalist horse had broken um, the parliamentarian horse, but then they had left the battlefield pursuing the parliamentarian horse who were fleeing and then robbing the kind of army's camp and baggage train or kind of, of loot, you know, mm. and it meant that that cavalry no longer could influence the battle that you basically commanders often found themselves in the situation where once they defeated the enemy cavalry, they lost control over their own cavalry, which just went off running around causing havoc in the rear guard, but didn't help on the battlefield. <laughs> um, and I think historians agree that Cromwell probably learnt from that lesson. Um, and uh, Martin Bennett, whose scholarship um, a lot of today's episodes uh, is based on, thinks that probably as well in the winter of 42, 43, 1642, 1643, Cromwell was studying... Uh, military manuals and accounts of battles from the Thirty Years' War, which was at that time still ongoing in Europe, and kind of learning some of these lessons without having to have, you know, had formal military training or have fought battles before. Yeah. And so when you got to 1643, warfare in the English Civil War was often very local, and he was involved in a couple of local skirmishes and battles. He'd actually expanded his troop of horse up into a regiment. They were known as the Ironsides because of how kind of tough and committed they were. There was a minor skirmish um, at a place called Grantham in, I think, May of 1643. And he was already showing um, some of his, some of his capabilities. He, um, what he did was he used dragoons, which was a kind of fairly new military innovation of musketeers mounted on horseback who would quickly ride um, to an advantageous position and then fire. Uh, they, they would dismount and then fire. So he used dragoons to um, basically disrupt the enemy's ranks. And then he led a um, cavalry charge, um, which was a tactic, he, he used a tactic borrowed from the Thirty Years' War, um, developed by the Swedish army, of the cavalry almost trotting towards their enemy and then suddenly breaking into a, a fierce charge, you know, building up speed, mm. and that quickly broke the enemy's lines. Uh, a few months later, in a minor battle called the Battle of Gainsborough, he once again led his cavalry regiment um, alongside other parliamentarians, pursuing a royalist force um, under a guy called Charles Cavendish um, through the uh, Lincolnshire countryside. And once again, the, um, the Ironsides, Cromwell's horse, were decisive in, in winning the day. Um, he apparently was able to um, break the enemy cavalry and um, he started to be become a bit of a... He was starting to get a bit of a reputation. He was yeah. promoted to colonel. He began to be singled out in the um, parliamentarian press and he, he began to gain a reputation as somebody who was um, both brave, personally brave in combat, um, and an effective leader of men. So according to the parliamentary, uh, parliamentarian press, a few months later, in October 1643, he led a cavalry charge, and when his, his horse was shot from under him, 
but he remounted and um, performed so much admirable courage and resolution that the enemy stood not another, hmm. um, to use a bit of 17th century language. Hmm. Now, what we're kind of seeing there is, I guess, the fruits of Cromwell's labour in terms of building up his horsemen as this, again, I'll use inverted commas, professional force of dedicated soldiers. Yeah in the face of a really determined cavalry charge, a lot of soldiers in the English Civil War are going to break because it. both armies, at least at this point, are very kind of, like I said, they're just recruited from the landowners, basically getting the peasants and the populace of their land to fight for them. You know, I'd say for the ordinary foot soldier, there's not much in the way of political passions about, the dispute between king and parliament. It's more they've been forced to fight whichever way their landowner has decided to go. Right. And Cromwell's kind of done an exceptional job of, uh, well, convincing his the soldiers that he's rounded up to fight for him. Absolutely. And I think his leadership qualities are kind of shining through, both in kind of leading from the front and inspiring devotion from his men. And that meant that, you know, his Ironsides were, of all these myriad kind of local, they were effectively militias, really. Mm. His is a kind of standout one. And so all these tactics and, and, and you know, the reputation that he's been building up so long now mm -hmm. really kind of comes to a bit of a head, doesn't it, at, at the Battle of Marston Moor? That's right. Um, so he'd actually been building up his regiment by the spring of 1644. It was the Ironsides were now what was known as a double regiment made up of 14 troops of horse. And they were part of the army, Parliament's army known as the Eastern Association. So like I said, it was very localized conflict. So you had uh, the Earl of Manchester, a parliamentary nobleman commanding the Eastern Association, the various forces in the east of England. Yours are things like the Western Association. Now, um, the north of England had generally been controlled um, by the Royalists, by people supporting King Charles. And to try and tip the balance in their favour, Parliament had done a deal with um, the Scottish, who to this point had really kept their noses out of the English Civil War, despite Charles also being their king. Right. And a Scottish army invaded the north of England on Parliament's side um, in 1644. And they joined up in Yorkshire with the Eastern Association Parliamentary Army to face the Royalist Northern Army, led by uh, one of Charles's relatives, Prince Rupert, probably the most famous Royalist commander. And they met uh, not far from York at a place called Marston Moor. And... Cromwell was put in charge of the left flank of the army. Um, right. He had under his command not just his Ironsides, but a selection of parliamentary horse. So probably about um, maybe 3,000 cavalry in all. Straight away, as the battle was starting, um, he acted independently and quickly in a kind of minor skirmish to ensure that the, his force had the best deployment position. He basically... Um, charged a few enemy horse and cavalry that was trying to um, outflank and set up an enfilading position that would have made Parliament's job very difficult. Um, but then the kind of main battle commenced, and what happened was you had the joint Scottish and Parliamentary Army facing off against the Royalists. And what usually happened was the infantry were always in the middle, like I've said, and they would clash, and on each flank you'd have a cavalry force and they would clash. And Cromwell on the left with the parliamentary cavalry charged into the royalist cavalry. The royalists probably a little bit foolishly um, basically launched a counter charge, charged straight into them instead of maybe holding their ground. And Cromwell's ironsides um, were soon beginning to get the better of them. Cromwell himself, um, once again, was literally kind of in the thick of the fighting. Um, 
he was wounded and had to leave the battlefield briefly to have his wound dressed in the neck remember correctly yeah he was he was shot in the neck uh with a with a musket and despite that you know you think you know you could probably check out of the battle mm-hmm. after being shot on the neck but no he came back and the ironsides um herds broken the royalist cavalry from the opposite flank but prince rupert the royalist commander had seen this and rode himself with his cavalry reserve to stop this kind of breakthrough. Now, things were kind of um, touch and go, but Cromwell um, counterattacked. He was supported by the Scottish horse under a guy called David Leslie, and they managed to break Rupert's cavalry reserve as well, and Rupert barely escaped with his life. Now, the crucial thing is... As the Royalist cavalry were fleed and broken, Cromwell's cavalry didn't pursue them. Yeah, They didn't just run off the battlefield chasing the enemy. Instead, they remained on the field, leaving the main bulk of the Royalist army, the infantry, completely exposed because their own cavalry had fleed. And so the Royalist army you know, was, was totally crushed. And that battle was so decisive, it basically handed the north of England to Parliament. I mean, it's not often that an entire region changes off the back of one singular battle. Particularly in a war which was very slow and attritional yeah. and local battles with, you know, a few thousand either side. There hadn't really been a battle as significant as Marston Moor to date, if you see what I mean, yeah. in the in the war. That was in one fell swoop, a giant portion of the country basically became untenable for the royalists to hold. Wow. So, what happens next? Well, next Parliament um, seems to be in a pretty good position because by October, they are closing in on the Royal Army of Charles I himself. He's got about 10,000 men, but he's outnumbered about two to one because three parliamentary armies, including the Eastern Association that Cromwell's part of, are closing in from three different directions. And in October 1644, there's the Battle of Newbury. Now, the aim is a kind of triple attack that is going to surround and crush and capture, hopefully, the king, which, you know, you would think sounds pretty um, decisive. Yeah. The trouble is um, things basically don't go to plan. The parliamentary attack is quite disjointed. The communications are poor. The commanders miss a series of kind of chances, basically. They they fail to clinch the advantage that they have, and the royalists be able to carry out a fighting retreat. And then overnight, um, the royalist army basically slips away, and the king is able to withdraw to his stronghold of Oxford. Um, Cromwell himself, it probably wasn't his finest hour um, in command, but he's extremely frustrated about what happened at Newbury. He basically thinks that his commander, the Earl of uh, Manchester, is not, you know, not up to the job. But he also thinks that basically Parliament and its army is not professional enough. It lacks a will to win, um, and that you know nothing is going to change if you know things carry on as they are. And the Earl of Manchester. Um, sums up kind of the defeated or defeatist attitude of the parliamentarians at this point. He he says that, you know, um, if we defeat the king 99 times, he is still the king. So right. kind of saying that all oh, this is pointless. And Cromwell is really, really unhappy about this. He basically takes the opposite view of, well, what is the point of us fighting this war, this military campaign, if success cannot be gained by military means? Hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's really unusual because Cromwell's own, you know, the the men that he's in command of, he's they're being held to a completely different standard from the rest of the parliamentary army. And exactly. It's uh, there. I know there's a lot of tension, you know, between his his units and the rest of the army. Um. 
what Cromwell does is he tries to basically change things. He tries to exploit this situation. Um, so in the winter of 1644-45, what he does is he goes back to London. He goes to Parliament because he's still an MP, a member of Parliament at this point. And he and his allies um, in Parliament basically push for thorough reform of the parliamentarian army. And what they do, and, you know, this is a key, I'd say one of the key moments of Cromwell's military career, ironically, happens in Parliament, yeah. um, is that he persuades Parliament to, through a series of ordinances and laws, to create a new army, to kind of almost start from scratch. Yeah. And this army is known as the New Model Army. You know, it's in a sense, I guess, yeah, a new model. New model of an uh, army. Can I just say, it's one yeah. of my favorite names for an army ever. I, I love it. <laughs> It is. It is quite. Um, I don't know. It's quite. It, it does what it says on the tin, doesn't it? Yeah, it could be it's my. It, it could be my love of Elvis Costello also coming through. <laughs> it does precisely, kind of what it's described, and it's. It is really trailblazing for the British Isles in the sense that this is going to be the first real, genuine professional army. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's not the first one on planet Earth. You know, the Romans had a professional oh, army. Yeah. In the Thirty Years' War, I've just described that was going on in Europe. Armies were becoming much more professionalized. And Cromwell is basically taking those lessons from Europe and applying them to the English Civil War. Again, this comes back to the most underrated general. This is a man who, prior to this, had no military experience and is thinking like a general. He is amazing. He is. And he, what he's doing is he's... He's learning lessons, you know, from foreign examples. Yeah. Um, and But also learning the lessons, I suppose, of his own short military career to date. Mm. You know, he's seen his own Ironsides perform very well, but he's also seen the parliamentarian army as a whole perform pretty poorly. Like I said, poor communication, poor cooperation between the different armies around the country, poor command. So... What do they do about it? Well, the new model army is going to be different. First of all, it's a national force mm. controlled by parliament. So it's not a regional militia set up by a landowner. This is, for the first time, the army of England. Yeah. And it is the precursor of the, the modern British army because it is a strict professional force a standing army that is controlled kind of from the center and it's not raised by whatever landowner or even you know in medieval times the king would raise an army no it is raised funded and directed by the state um which you know straight away is groundbreaking yeah it has a uniform and because the cheapest dye available is red, the infantry are going to wear red coats, mm. which obviously um, has implications for many years to A come. Significant implication, yes. <laughs> Good point. Their equipment is standardized and, again, bought and provided by the state. Previously, you know, each landowner would have to buy the equipment for his men or they would have to buy it themselves. And so can you imagine the hodgepodge and the kind of discrepancy between the standard and quality of, of equipment from one regiment to the next? Mm. They are going to be trained. Um, so some of these troops are integrated from the existing association armies. Some of them are newly recruited, but they're all going to go through proper kind of drill and training of formations and marching and kind of battle uh, formations and tactics. They are going to be um, paid, like I said, by the state. And one of the most important things that Cromwell really pushed for was something called the self-denying ordinance. What happened was it's this was a kind of decree, a law that said that if you're a member of parliament, either the House of Lords, like the Earl of Manchester, mm. or the House of Commons, like Cromwell, you cannot 
hold a officer post in the army? The officers have to be professional soldiers. Wow. I mean, that's kind of groundbreaking, isn't it? I mean, this whole yeah. thing is groundbreaking, but that particular kind of unheard of. And the officers had to be promoted on merit. You know, the association armies were led by, you know, um, landed oligarchs like, say, the Earl of Manchester or the Earl of Essex. Mm. You know, the the highest, the, you know, they held the highest command posts because they were the highest nobles in the land, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, now, although the vast majority of officers were from, you know, pretty prestigious backgrounds, um, they were people who'd either proven themselves over the last couple of years or who had previous military experience. For example, the commander of the new model army um, was Sir Thomas Fairfax, who had fought um, with the Dutch army, basically as a mercenary. So he had previous military experience even before the English Civil War. And you had um, officers like um, Colonel Pride, who was a drayman, a brewer before the Civil War. Hmm. Um, so you had people promoted on merit. Again, it's, it's. I mean, it's it's very revolutionary. I mean, yeah, it's amazing what kind of lessons you can learn by looking at actual, you know, other standing armies. Yeah, so they, they managed to very swiftly raise, train, equip, and kind of put together a force that was to consist of 14,400 foot, 6,000 horse, 1,000 dragoons. Um, so in total, around about 22,000 men. But this was like a national force across the country. That wasn't kind of all in one place, yeah. if you see what I mean. Of course, the only problem... Um, was that the self-denying ordinance meant that Oliver Cromwell couldn't hold a post in the new model army because he was a member of parliament. Hmm. That's going to be a bit of a problem, I think. Well, yes. Um, I think people both in parliament and particularly in the army were not too happy about that. Um, and especially as, you know, Cromwell's Ironsides were not only probably the most feared unit in the army, but were kind of the model on which this army's been based. It doesn't make much sense that the architect is not allowed to be part of it, does it? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> so basically four exceptions were made to the self-denying ordinance, um, and Cromwell was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so he was appointed as commander of, of the horse, of the cavalry. And it really, I think the New Model Army as well had a spirit drawn from the Ironsides, you know, if you um, you weren't allowed to uh, loot the kind of local people, um, you uh, blasphemy, blasphemy was punishable with um, a hot needle poked through the tongue. So it, it, it kind of, um, to some extent, the New Model Army also imbued the kind of Purit Puritan um religious and radical ideas that Cromwell himself had had. Yeah. Huh. That's uh I mean when you're when you're controlling an entire army. I mean, all right, so what kind of, you know, variety of faiths would you have seen within the new model army? A lot of um People would have been Church of England, Protestant. There was a strong, within the parliamentary side, Presbyterian mm. um, presence. The Puritans were a minority, people like Cromwell. Um, interestingly as well, you also had um, kind of radical political beliefs begin to develop in the New Model Army. Right. Um, you had a movement called the Levellers, who believed that all men were equal and should therefore all be able to vote. Mm. Um, you also had a movement even more radical called the Diggers, who believed that um, all the land of England should be divided up equally and divided equally between all you know men and that everyone would dig and farm the land themselves rather than having other people working their estates. Wow. That's... Um like hyper balkanization 
Well, it, it's kind of almost like a precursor to communism in a way, yeah, isn't it? It's, no, that's kind it's of amazing. Kind of a weird early modern version yeah. of communism. Um, so this was a professional force. It was also, as as you can kind of tell, quite a dedicated force for a large part. But it was a green force. You know, they had never fought. A, the New Model Army was untried, untested, if you like. So going into 1645, the campaigning season, uh, the Royalists, I believe, were quite contemptuous of the New Model Army. They thought that the King's you know, Royal Army, about between eight ten thousand men, which had been campaigning, you know, for three years now, lots of experienced soldiers. They thought, even though the new model actually outnumbered them by a few thousand, they thought they 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 would be fine. And so the Royal Army of King Charles faced off against Fairfax and Cromwell's new model at the Battle of Naseby in June 1645. And guess who was a decisive influence on the outcome? Hmm, I wonder. Well, once again, Oliver Cromwell was in charge of um, the horse, and he was on um, the right flank of the army. Hmm. And once again, you had a case of the discipline and the kind of... um, tactics employed by the cavalry would be decisive to the outcome right so the royalist foot um engaged the parliamentarian foot but for a time it seemed like the royalist foot was winning because a lot of the new model army was untested whilst these royalists were kind of veteran troops but on the flanks on one side you had prince rupert in charge of a wing of royalist cavalry they routed Parliament's cavalry, but then pursued them off the battlefield. Oh, they made the mistake. The classic blunder. Absolutely right. Whereas on the right, Cromwell's um, cavalry, including his old Ironsides, um, they, what they did was um, they engaged the royalist uh, flank cavalry opposite them, they used several waves of attacks. He basically formed up his cavalry into um, kind of waves, if you like, at Cromwell. He only used... Um, he, had, he had kind of had three great lines, and he only needed to use a part of that to rout the royalist horse. And then, with his already kind of fully formed reserve in place, he was able to wheel right round and attack the royalist foot in their flank. Hmm. Um, not only that, but he kept some in reserve when the Royalist Reserve came into battle, just as it had at Marston Moor, remember. He had his own reserves ready waiting for them. So Cromwell was quite decisive in changing the course of the battle because he routed the Royalist horse opposite him. He kept the Royalist Reserves busy. And in the meantime, he could outflank and do away with the infantry. And, and but so the what was happening with the rest of the uh, with the battle at this point in time? Um... Well, often with battles like this, once soldiers realise that they've been outflanked, mm. then things start to crumble very quickly because nobody wants to be trapped in a massacre. So once Cromwell had got into this advantageous position on the right flank the Royalist force quickly crumbles and about a 1,000 were killed, 5,000 captured in the rout. Charles I managed to get away, but his royal army had basically been destroyed. Mm. It was arguably the decisive battle of the English Civil War because the king's army basically was no more. Yeah. And there was only one more Royalist field army left in the whole country, which was down in the West Country under a guy called um, Lord Goring. So the new model, the following month, marched into Somerset, engaged this uh, smaller Royalist army, and um, once again 
crushed it with uh, Cromwell's horse playing a key role again. Mm. So there it is. They've got uh, they've got Charles, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> maybe that should have been the end of the English Civil War. Um, and indeed, it was the end of the what's called the first English Civil War. Yeah. Um, so the king surrendered in 1646, his armies having been swept from the field the previous year by the new model. Once they'd won, though, Parliament had a bit of a problem because it was sort of like, what do we do now? Yeah. Um, you had a situation where um, you've got the king captured, but what do we do with him? At that point, no one was considering killing him because um, he was the king. Yeah. The trouble was Charles was obstinate. He was not willing to negotiate. He was not willing to give up his power. And the negotiations basically hit a dead end. There was some um, semi-comedic escape attempts by Charles and then in 1648, a second civil war broke out because Charles secretly did a deal with the Scots. He was the King of Scotland, after all, and he persuaded the Scots, who were Presbyterian, that this kind of radical um, Puritan English parliament is going to interfere with your religion. Right. And so the Scottish army, there was a kind of royalist uprisings, um, across the country, and a Scottish army who had, of course, been Parliament's allies, now invaded to try and rescue Charles. Mm. Now, Thomas Fairfax led off his part of the New Model Army to deal with one of the royalist uprisings, but that left Cromwell in charge of another portion of the army, and for the first time... Um, marching to meet the Scots, he found himself in command of an army. Hmm. So how well does he actually fare in, in battle while in charge of an entire army? Yeah, so he had probably about 11,000 men. And they started off in Wales, besieging Prembrook Castle, which had, been, which had rebelled. And then they marched north to face the Scots. And the Scots... Probably had about 11,500 men, but they'd also been joined by two smaller English royalist um, forces, totaling together about 5,500. So Cromwell was clearly outnumbered. Right. He able, was able to cover the ground extremely quickly. Um, about 450 miles he marched in total. And the Scottish commander, the Earl um, of Hamilton, uh, just didn't believe that Cromwell could be, you know, within striking distance. And what that meant was the Scottish army was unprepared for battle when it came and was strung out along the road, if you see what I mean. Mm. You know, a large army of, of ten, more than 10,000 men is kind of scattered about when it's on the march. You know, we talked about that in the Crusades episode, didn't we? Yeah. Um, it's not all, you know, deployed together. So... What Cromwell did was very, actually, a little bit unorthodox, but it was very successful. He sent a small force, about 600 men, north of the town of Preston um, to distract and tie down the enemy. But he was going to approach Preston, uh, which is in northwest England. He was going to approach it from uh, the east. Now, that would involve crossing Preston Moor, which was not good terrain. There was basically lots of enclosed fields, you know, lots of yeah. fences, stone walls. And this would make, uh, you know, particularly cavalry action really difficult because, you know, you can't exactly charge when there's, you know, another little stone wall every awesome. hundred yards. There was a road, a kind of lane leading into Preston as well. But this was a bit of an obstacle too, because it was like a sunken lane, if you see what I mean, a sunken road mm. with banks up either side. So if you marched your soldiers along this road, yeah. they are going to instantly be at a disadvantage. Yeah. Now, what Cromwell did, now that he's a kind of in army command, 
was quite um, unique and would be a precursor of some kind of formations of the future. What he did was, counterintuitively, he deployed his cavalry on the road. But in order that they wouldn't be ambushed or outflanked, he deployed his infantry either side of the road. So the cavalry wouldn't fare well in the fields. So he put them on the flat road so that once they'd broken through, they could gallop into the town of Preston, if you Ah, see what I mean, and and run amok. So on the 17th of August, uh, 1648, they marched forwards. And he had his two two regiments of horse marching up the road. He had three regiments of foot on the right of the road, two on the left, plus a reserve of both horse and foot. And an English royalist called Langdale had a covering force protecting the entrance to Preston um, of about 3,000 foot and 500 horse. So they were outnumbered because the rest of the Scottish army was kind of strung out in different places. And the overall Scottish commander, Hamilton, decided basically that he was going to try and get across the river south of Preston um, and kind of get away and hold on the river line. So the new model under Cromwell engaged um, and were able to turn this sunken lane from a disadvantage into an advantage. They engaged Langdale's forces. It was a tough, hard slog. Langdale's men, by all accounts, fought extremely hard for about four hours, trying to buy enough time um, for the kind of Scottish army to either. Well, he probably hoped to reinforce them, but actually they were trying to get away. But eventually, by the afternoon, Cromwell's tactic worked. The horse kind of spearhead down the middle broke through, charged into the town, and they were able to not only capture Langdale's forces and three Scottish regiments that had been dispatched to help Langdale, but before sundown, they were able to basically swiftly get through the town to the bridges and cross the river. So Hamilton's hope of setting up a new defensive line along the river were dead in the water. I thought it, this, this moves so quickly. He basically, in an afternoon, destroyed any hope of this Scottish invasion succeeding. Yeah. Because he had totally cut off, you know, parts of the Scottish army were north of the river, parts of them were even, um, you know, south of the river, and he'd totally undone his opponent's plans. According, you know, to the figures from the time, which, you know, we may or may not trust, but according to the figures from the time, the Scottish Royalist Coalition suffered 2,000 killed and 9,000 captured. You know, and this is from an army totaling about 15,000. Yeah, so, 16, yeah, 11, so that's... you get 11,000 of your men captured or, or killed. And again, there might be a trace of propaganda here, but according to um, the figures from the time, to just 100 parliamentarians dead. So what he'd done is capture a huge chunk of this army. Now, they fought really hard, so they weren't able to pursue the Scots as quickly as they would have liked. But the Scots basically had to retreat, but retreat south, if you see what I mean. Mm. Because Cromwell had taken Preston and they'd withdrawn over the bridge. They couldn't just run back to Scotland. So over the next few days, he, he chased them. Um, there was a battle at Winnick Pass outside the town of Warrington two days later where the new model overwhelmed the Scots. Um, They drove them into the town. The infantry surrendered. The Scottish cavalry ran. But by the 25th of August, Hamilton and his cavalry too had to surrender. So single-handedly, he dismantled this Scottish invasion and brought an end to the Second English Civil War. So how many days in total did the... This, the Second English Civil War last, because it sounds uh, not very long. Yeah, just a few months. Um, and as you can imagine, that uh, the, the, the triggering of this Second Civil War had really polarised opinion hmm. about Charles I. Because Charles had lost, he'd been captured, and now he was seen as kind of being a warmonger, betraying his country by getting a, an invasion in. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And, and starting it up all over again. 
and opinion, particularly in the New Model Army, had hardened considerably. There was something called Pride's Purge, where Colonel Pride, who I mentioned before, um, basically the army stormed Parliament and removed or barred entry of all MPs who basically didn't want to execute the king. Right. And the remainder what was known as the Rump Parliament. Um, the remainder of MPs left, about 150 of them, including Cromwell, agreed to put the king on trial for basically for treason, for betraying his own country by calling in this Scottish invasion. Mm. Um, and famously in January 1649, the king was executed and the Rump Parliament declared England a commonwealth without a monarch. The first time it's ever happened in English history. Yeah, the long history of the English monarchy, um, there was, at least temporarily, a blip, a gap. Yeah. Um, and Cromwell was obviously a leading figure now in this commonwealth. Mm. But the fighting hadn't finished um, because Scotland and Ireland, which, as I said, were also ruled by Charles, recognized Charles' son, Charles II, as their rightful king. Right. But England, or at least, you know, the parliamentarians running England now, obviously couldn't accept this. For one thing, you know, that's potentially two enemy bases on your doorstep for which they might just invade again. Yeah. Secondly, Ireland, which was, you know, technically under English rule, had been in rebellion since 1641. Um, and thirdly, you had royalist forces, English royalist forces in Ireland. Mm. Um, so the logical next step, if you like, was to target Ireland. Yeah, and he does target Ireland, and I, I think this is... One of the things that kind of makes Cromwell a bit of a polarizing figure in the in, in the grand scheme of things, it's, uh, absolutely um, happens in Ireland. He, uh, Cromwell is a very controversial figure in Ireland um, because of what happens next. Yeah. Um, so basically, the Irish rebels, which was called the Confederacy, the Irish Confederacy, and the English royalists who were based in Ireland basically agreed to a temporary alliance against the parliamentarians. And in August 1649, Cromwell lands with a big chunk of the New Model Army in Ireland. They land in Dublin, which is basically the only outpost left that Parliament control in the country. And what he does is, first of all, he targets the port cities on Ireland's east coast. Yeah. So he marches fifty mile, uh, about fifty kilometers north of Dublin to a city called Drogheda. At Drogheda, there's a garrison of three thousand English royalists and Irish Confederate troops. So the New Model Army lays siege. Lasts about a week, and then they manage to breach the walls, and Cromwell demands that the garrison surrender. Now this is where the controversy begins because. The garrison refused to surrender and the New Model Army stormed the city. But Cromwell orders that no quarter be given. Yeah. So the royalist commander, a guy called Aston, is beaten to death with his own wooden leg. 2,800 soldiers out of a garrison of 3,000 are killed, as well as estimated, uh, estimated about seven to 800 civilians, including apparently all the Catholic priests in the city. Mm. Again, probably worth mentioning that this still has a lot of religious undertones. To it. Uh, you, Absolutely. You can, so we know the new model away. and Cromwell himself are, you know, strongly religious and Puritan. And Ireland, of course, is a Catholic country. Apparently, in the Siege of Drogheda, there was only about 150 new model army killed, although, again, I believe those were the figures from the time. It's a stunning military success, but it obviously creates, to this day, a reputation for Cromwell. Yeah. Now, 
there was even stories that soldiers who'd sought sanctuary in church in churches the kind of ancient concept of you know you could go into a church and it would be sanctuary you were not allowed to be mm. kind of taken out there apparently they were even killed on the other hand for siege warfare in the 17th century historians like tom riley argue this was not unusual if a city didn't agree to surrender a you know a sack and a massacre usually followed I mean, we saw it plenty in our Crusades episodes, oh, yeah. didn't we? This was how warfare was done, you know, up until modern times when kind of rules of of war were put in place. When a city resists, it becomes fair game. On the other hand, of course, it is hard to comprehend and hard to balance a man who was deeply religious... Mm. who openly sought God's guidance in his decision-making. It's hard to kind of square that, isn't it, with this kind of slaughter? Yeah, well, it, it's like we mentioned in our Crusades episode, um, our, our first Crusades episode, where these are, are, you know, very devout Christians massacring a lot of people. And in this in this case, I mean, of course, also it happens in the, in the Fourth Crusade with the sack of of uh, Constantinople, Constantinople, and that's probably more comparable in this case because that was similarly, you know, a Christian on Christian massacre. Yeah. Um, this obviously different sects, but the point is still there. Well- Ironically, these port cities on the coast were more Anglo-Irish in culture yeah. than the Irish countryside. Um, and so a lot of the Irish people, some people argue this actually hardened their resistance because they thought, well, if that's how they're treating kind of an Anglo-Irish community, what's in store for us? Yeah. And he went on over the next few months to capture a series of uh, of of cities, um, Wexford, Waterford, uh, Duncannon. Wexford is actually um, almost more controversial than Drogheda. The New Model Army managed to break into the city while negotiations were ongoing. Um, they burnt much of it to the ground, killed the garrison, which was about 2,000 men, and a further 1,500 townspeople. Now, in the context of warfare at the time, Cromwell, for the first time, you've got to remember here, is operating on kind of enemy soil. Mm -hmm. Up to now, he's been fighting in England. So to some extent, is he trying to... Well, is he, A, just following the rules of war at the time, or the norms of war at the time? Is he trying to intimidate the Irish into giving up, you know, into not resisting, into future cities not fighting back? Or is there more to this in terms of what we're kind of suggesting, that religious hatred um, spilling forth? Mm. And I think that's at the root of the controversy um, of Oliver Cromwell and the reason he is very unpopular amongst Irish uh, Catholics. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, It's a very difficult topic to talk about. Um, it's very, very, uh, very sensitive. Yeah, it, 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 you know, we will. Well, the next a couple of events kind of pave a way to some of the problems in Ireland in the twentieth century. Um, so after after taking all those cities, he winters in Ireland in sixteen forty nine fifty. Spring of sixteen fifty. Um, once again, Cromwell moves up looking to mop up the southeast of Ireland. He captures Kilkenny, which is the capital of the Irish Confederacy, which surrenders. Mm. Again, you might say, from a military point of view, that's the fruit of what happened before. There is resistance at a city called Clonmel. Up to 2,000 New Model Army soldiers are actually killed in that siege, but the city does actually surrender 
and there isn't a massacre there. And again, there's a question marks. Was Cromwell softening his stance? Mm. Or then again, it was actually the rules of siege warfare. If a city surrendered, then, you know, you couldn't carry out a massacre yeah. or a sack. But um, midway through 1650, for reasons we'll get to, Cromwell has to leave Ireland. Mm. Nevertheless, the new model army or contingents of it continue campaigning up to 1652, where they've basically subjugated the whole island of Ireland, ending 11 years of conflict there. Um, In total, the new model lost probably about 8,000 across the Irish campaign, compared to reportedly 15 to 20,000 English royalists and Irish Confederate soldiers. But once again, the controversy, hundreds of thousands of civilians died. Yeah. Um, now, those mostly were not massacred. Uh, you know, the numbers we've talked about in the massacres are hundreds or low thousands. But the campaign across Ireland unleashes, you know, all those things that warfare often does, disease, famine, exactly. you know, people being displaced. And hundreds of thousands of civilians during the war in Ireland perish for these reasons yeah not only that but land is expropriated from irish catholics and twelve thousand new model army soldiers are settled on irish land remember these are mostly hardened protestants or even puritans Hmm. and so it's not the first time protestants have been settled in ireland um for the benefit of the english but it helps build up a situation which exists to this day of religious division on the island of Ireland. Yeah. That's the thing, talking about Cromwell, is that there are a a lot of things which lead up to the modern day. Cromwell, I mean, definitely one of the most influential in all of British history. Absolutely, you know... um, already obviously at this point we know that the king's dead and parliament or at least a group of mps from parliament are in control of the country Mm. cromwell being one of the most important of them he so you know this is a precursor to parliamentary democracy eventually and obviously it's a long and twisty road but it's certainly a precursor to that coming to britain the creation of the new model is the precursor to the british army And his activities in Ireland was a precursor to modern um, conflicts there. Mm. On the other hand, if we're looking at this episode as history's most underrated general, his military record to date is outstanding. Yeah. He has campaign in Ireland was bloody, but it was extremely successful. And it puts an end, like I said, to 11 years of rebellion in the island of Ireland. He's pretty much single-handedly won the Second English Civil War by defeating the Scots. And as we saw in at least two very important battles of the First English Civil War, his cavalry played the decisive role. Yeah, an employment of tactics that un- unbelievably successful. Absolutely. Now you mentioned um, when we were in Ireland, you mentioned that... Uh reasons he had to leave but what well it was once again scotland was the problem Ah. Um, because scotland had recognized charles ii the son of the executed charles as their king Mm. so this again proved you know that there was an immediate threat on the doorstep charles ii who was in exile could land in scotland at any time and invade England. So Parliament basically had to, well, felt it had to go to war with Scotland to nullify the threat. So in July 1650, Cromwell invaded Scotland with a force probably of about 16,000 men from the New Model Army. David Leslie, who'd saved him um, and his Ironsides at the Battle of Marston Moor, was now his enemy in command of the Scottish Army. Oh. The Scottish army was probably about 22,000 men. 
so significantly larger. Mm. But Leslie didn't confront Cromwell. Instead, he basically carried out a retreat, a scorched earth retreat um, through the lowlands of Scotland to prepare defences around Edinburgh. Mm. Now, the reason he did that is, well, well, for one, he was probably a bit intimidated um, with Cromwell and the new model approaching. But the Scottish army was a kind of shadow, really, of its former self in that, you know, it had fought some key battles in the English Civil War, the first English Civil War. Cromwell had really taken it to pieces at the Battle of Preston. So a lot of it was a very raw and um, inexperienced force, Mm. which is obviously going to be important for what happens next. Yeah. Um, Now, of course, uh, the New Model Army was also relatively fresh-faced and experienced, but uh, they didn't have... uh, Yeah... Well, they, they 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 had the discipline, and they had they had Cromwell. They did, and you've got to remember they're now we're now five years into yeah. the existence of the army, where they fought at Naseby, they've defeated King Charles the First, they've defeated the Scots at Preston. Many probably had fought in Ireland too. Nevertheless. It doesn't go well at first, this Scottish campaign for Cromwell. Hmm. Because of the scorched earth policy, Leslie leaves nothing behind for the English. The new model force under Cromwell basically has to receive all its supplies from England, which makes things very difficult. They have mostly landed at the port of Dunbar, not far from Edinburgh. Cromwell also isn't really too keen on fighting the Scots, um, who, of course, as we know, have been his allies. He wrote to them, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. Um, and by the end of August, you know, the Cromwell's army is two months in, they haven't fought a battle, they're demoralized, they're weakened by disease, they may well have lost up to 5,000 men to disease, they're running low on supplies. So they begin a slow withdrawal to Dunbar, which is their supply base, as I said. Hmm. Now, this is where David Leslie sees his opportunity. So he gets his Scottish army in pursuit, and he actually manages to overtake and reach Dunbar before Cromwell. And what he does is he deploys his army on Dune Hill, which is a hill that overlooks both Dunbar and it overlooks the road south. Hmm. So Cromwell can't access his supplies, but he also can't retreat back to England. The road south is now overlooked by the enemy army. And he probably can't attack Leslie either, because Leslie's got his much larger army on top of a hill. Right. So an attack would be suicide. And this is where Cromwell... This is arguably one of Cromwell's greatest victories because it seems an impossible position. Yeah. He's outnumbered possibly two to one. His men are demoralized and starving and disease ridden. He can't retreat. He can't access more supplies. He can't attack. What can he do? I mean, this is something that probably some some modern generals would say, well, what do we do? (laughs) Maybe raise the white flag. Uh, But Cromwell, in what he saw, certainly as, um, well, he he quoted the Bible, Joshua, the Lord hath delivered them into our hands. Because on the 2nd of September, inexplicably, Leslie marches his force down off Dune Hill in preparation to attack Cromwell's camp the following day. It's believed that he was under pressure to, basically get this war over and done with because the Scottish were running out of money. Mm. And the army had been in the field for several months. It's an expensive thing to do, supply and feed them and pay them. So given their position of superiority, he was under pressure to quickly let's wrap this campaign up. Right. But when they got to the bottom of the hill, they were positioned poorly, basically, To their front, there was a deep ditch with a burn, a small river running through it. And obviously behind them, they had the hill. 
So inexplicably, Cromwell instantly recognised, and this was something he did, you know, throughout his career, the land, and realised that the Scottish army had almost trapped itself between two natural features. They've just made a massive blunder. Absolutely. I mean, you know, instead of just waiting, I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, God only knows what would have actually happened, but instead of waiting and potentially winning this battle <laughs> by being spurred on to win the war, they end up. I'm, I'm. Well, let me let me assume this doesn't go well for the uh, for the Scots. No, the Battle of Dunbar is is again possibly a high point of Cromwell's military career. Overnight, the 2nd to 3rd of September, um, what he does is he moves his army, moves the bulk of it to face the Scottish right flank, because the right flank, um, a lot of these battles, you know, well, all of them, you can easily find a, a map on Google. It's, it's mm. great to visualise it. But this ditch ran along the front of most of the Scottish army, but the right flank had access to a road leading into Dunbar. So the right flank, if they were going to escape or maneuver in any way, the right flank was the part that could. The rest of the army, as I said, was kind of trapped between two natural features. So what Cromwell did was overnight, he moved the vast bulk of his army to be facing the Scottish right flank so that they would be kind of trapped there. The rest of the army, you know, would be stuck in position with only a kind of... um, shielding force from Cromwell to keep them in place. Hmm. So, on the morning of the 3rd of September, the Scots were really taken by surprise when a huge um, new model army assault was launched, mainly against their right flank. After some hard fighting, the right flank crumbled. The uh, Scottish cavalry fled, and the rest of the army, realising the situation it was in, as we've kind of seen with other battles, realised this is it, and run. Mm. Um, Cromwell's forces pursue the Scots for about eight miles. Um, again, according to the figures at the time, the parliamentarians lost just 20 killed and 48 wounded. And yet, Leslie and his retreat um, reached the town of Stirling with just four or 5,000 men. Apparently, Cromwell, on the morning of the battle, was so nervous because he knew what a difficult situation he was in that he was Hmm. biting his lip repeatedly and so hard that he was bleeding from the mouth. But when the victory came and when it was clear they had won the Battle of Dunbar, he reportedly uh, basically was in a hysterical fit of laughing. Yeah, I've heard uh, heard that Rama was kind of prone to having this... (laughs) He was very, he was very uh, emotional, man, wasn't he? Yeah, I think the uh, the way I interpret that is he's kind of almost like the relief of it, yeah. the lifting of it, the it, pressure, yeah. brought euphoria. Um, but he had pulled off seemingly, and you know he would, he definitely thought of it this way: a miraculous, divine kind of divinely inspired victory. And I, I he I know he gave credit to God for pretty much all of his victories, didn't he? Yeah, he did, and obviously he had a big chunk of luck there. But on the other hand, you know you can't deny both his abilities as a commander and as a leader of men, but also his kind of more organizational side of it in building up this force into what it was. Yeah. Um. And even in a very tough situation like that, it clearly was an extremely formidable fighting force. Yeah. It's amazing. So, uh, what happens? What happens with uh, with Charles II? He doesn't really have much of a leg to stand on, it, does he? No, the, the unsurprisingly Cromwell withdraws temporarily after that because of the poor situation his army was in. Mm. But nevertheless, by the end of 1650, the majority of southern Scotland was now under um, the English control. Charles II, however, arrived in Scotland in January 1651, and he was crowned 
King of Great Britain, which obviously mm. emphasized where his ambitions lay. Yeah. Now, the extent to which the army relied on Cromwell was shown by the fact that um, the campaign didn't continue until July of 1651 because Cromwell suffered a series of illnesses. He had dysentery, he had kidney stones. Um, you know, by this point, he was 50, probably 51 years of age, and he'd been on campaign for the best part of a decade. Yeah. So um, he he kind of, for pretty much six months, was out of action. But, you know, how important he was to the New Model Army and to Parliament was shown by the fact they didn't just go ahead without him. Hmm. Like no one, can, so, no one can lead this except for him. Yeah. So the new model marched again in July of 1651. Uh, one of his generals, Lambert, defeated uh, the main Scottish army, or a portion of it at least. Um, but Cromwell, what he did was he marched to Perth, which is kind of um, on the southern edge of the highlands of Scotland. And he, the reason he did that was he cut off the Scottish retreat. Mm. Like I said, the English were already controlling southern Scotland, but the defeated Scots with Charles II in tow now couldn't withdraw into the Highlands. They couldn't um, withdraw, and they also couldn't access reinforcements. And this left Charles II um, and his Scottish allies in a very tricky situation. And from best we can tell, Cromwell did this deliberately, but he forced Charles II into staking everything on a gigantic gamble mm. on invading England. He couldn't march north, so he had to march south. Right. He couldn't stay in Scotland because he was going to get picked off by Cromwell and Lambert's forces. And it seems that Cromwell had prepared and forewarned England and Parliament and the new model forces further south that this was going to happen. So we've seen quite a few tactical triumphs. What was to come, I think, was arguably Cromwell's best strategic triumph in that he counterintuitively and, you know, a little bit unorthodoxly forced his enemy to invade England. Yeah, it's uh, not something you hear every day, but, I mean, it worked. Absolutely. So Charles II leads a, right, a rather kind of ragtag force of about 16,000 Scots into England. It doesn't have much success recruiting English royalists, but throughout their journey, they are harassed um, and chased by English forces, not least Cromwell himself, who, having been up in Perth, has his army marching 20 miles a day through the summer heat, basically pursuing um, Charles II and pushing them further and further westwards, so away from London. Yeah. And they actually reach, by the 22nd of August, just Charles II's force, the city of Worcester, which is um, in the Midlands. It's, you know, if you look up a map of England, it's a long way south. Mm. Um, and Cromwell's army, as well as various parliamentary armies being kind of coming from different directions, encircle... Charles II and the Scots at Worcester. And he has about 28,000 men to Charles's 16,000. So the result is very much a foregone conclusion. Hmm. But the final battle, uh, which Cromwell describes as his crowning mercy, is another kind of masterclass. He delays um, engaging Charles for two reasons. First of all, he builds a series of pontoon bridges crossing because this area has, has the River Severn, the River Fleetwood and different tributaries. So he basically creates a kind of infrastructure um, to launch a kind of three-pronged assault. And the, the Scottish positions weren't just in the city itself. They were kind of laid out in the fields and roads surrounding the city. Yeah. Um, he also delays the attack till the 3rd of September because it is the anniversary to the day of the Battle of Dunbar. Ah. 
so kind of thinking also, I think, about the morale aspect, which clearly I think he felt was very important, you know, discipline and morale and determination. Mm -hmm. He clearly valued very highly. Now, such a large force of 28,000 men with numerous kind of generals under his command, um, this wasn't a battle. And also, you know, he's, I think by now he'll be 52 years old. He isn't charging in with the iron sides this time. But what Cromwell was in the Battle of Worcester was he was a very effective firefighter as this, you know, surrounded and quite determined royalist force fought hard and carried out counterattacks against the multiple new model army pushes. Cromwell shifted brigades um, to different kind of hard points, if you like, of resistance, tough spots, places where counterattacks were being launched. So he was quite dexterous and he was moving his force to where it needed to go. I would say it was a superb example of, of management of a battle. Yeah. Whereas some of his other battles we've seen is almost kind of personal courage and leading a charge. Here, Cromwell was the kind of manager putting the forces where they need to be, directing from above, providing a clear kind of focus and objective. Hmm. And as it kind of the afternoon wears on into the evening, the royalists basically withdraw into the city and it becomes a rout. Um, Parliament, the parliamentary forces capture the city, capture about 10,000 men, reportedly another 3,000 killed. And from a force of 16,000, Charles II's forces basically cease to exist. Yeah. Um, Atkinson describes it as one of those rare victories in which a pursuit is super superfluous. It was so complete a victory. You didn't need to chase mm -hmm. the, the retreating enemy. The war and the battle, you know, was so completely won that it was kind of over. Checkmate. Exactly. Charles II himself did manage to escape um, and famously hid up a tree uh, to escape <laughs> uh, the attentions of the new model uh, pursuers. He then, over the next few weeks, stayed in various just ordinary people's houses, lying low, and managed to get himself out of the country for nine years in exile. But that is the end of Oliver Cromwell's military career. Um, as you can imagine, he was by now the pretty much the dominant personality in the parliamentary side, the parliamentary yeah. faction. And in 1653, he is elevated to the position of Lord Protector, which effectively is head of state, is king in any other name, really. He was referred to as Your Highness. Yeah. And to his death, he, he rules England. And, well, not just England, England, Scotland, and Ireland, what was referred to as the Commonwealth. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more to kind of dive into with Cromwell. I know that we're mainly focusing on his military career. Title of the episode is a great general. But... Cromwell, uh, his political career, um, and just as a person as well, is so intensely fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Um, he almost seems sometimes to be a man of contradictions. Yeah. Um, because the government, the um, protectorate, takes almost an increasingly authoritarian turn um, in the 1650s. Parliament is basically suspended. There's an attempt at having almost like an appointed parliament. Um, you have quite um, draconian rules and laws brought in. Christmas is infamously banned, as is dancing and the theatre, yeah. things like that. Um, and at the same time, he he seems to be as we've said many times, so deeply religious that his political decision-making as well, he seeks the guidance of God. Um, he was offered in 1657 the crown. They offered yeah. him the chance to be king. And he, he thought about it for three months, which both indicates he clearly wasn't opposed to the concept of monarchy, mm -hmm. um, as maybe it might be imagined he was if you kind of looked at the surface level. But apparently, you know, he was seeking 
God's guidance as what he should do. And he clearly was extremely conflicted about what he should do. Yeah. Um, I know in the, in the end, I think it was the army based approachment. So if you take this position, this is what we've been fighting against for all these years. If you take this position, done. That kind of yeah, him not- the army remained a really influential part of politics. Um, and when he got to the end of his life, when he died, he uh, he was succeeded by his son, Richard Cromwell, mm. um, became the next Lord Protector, which kind of shows it, 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 in many yeah, ways. It is just basically king in yeah. every way, but, but the title's Richard, hereditary. Yeah, Richard was a was a weak leader. Um, he became known as Tumble Down Dick because he was overthrown mm. um, by the military the following year. Um, there was then a kind of short period of like a military directory of the generals being in charge. And in 1660, Parliament was recalled and basically opted to recall Charles II from exile and the restoration. Um, as it's known, occurred where the monarchy was restored and has remained ever since. And Charles II had Oliver Cromwell's body dug up, uh, beheaded, I think hung, drawn and quartered, um, and distributed across the kingdom. Yeah. Um, He didn't take both defeat and the beheading of his father well. Yeah. um, I mean, I don't expect him to. Um... But uh, yes, a uh, rather uh, a rather unceremonious end, in a way, to one of the most important and, and influential people in all of British history. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> in definitely, um, to any of our listeners who have found this this fascinating, I found. Um, I'd highly recommend do some reading, watch some documentary because they'll go into a, a lot of uh, detail in, in terms of yeah. personal life that we couldn't get into today. Um, because there is just so much to unpack with Oliver Cromwell. Such a yeah, fascinating... I mean, we couldn't talk much about his political career. Yeah, because we've been focused uh, as his, as a general um, and his remarkable military career. You know, like we said, as um, to some extent, been overlooked because of his political career. Yeah, um, that's a, he's not really thought of as a great general of history. Yeah, it's a it's a good point, um, but it's it's ironic when you consider the fact that the reason he was, uh, you know, even in politics at all was because of how successful he was as a military commander. Um, Absolutely. So he, it, it's been overshadowed, but you know, he got there off the back of incredibly bewilderingly. Successful. And again, I'd just like to mention a man who no military experience whatsoever. Yeah, at age 43 as well. We're not talking about oh, yeah. a 20 year old no. fighting for the first time. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those moments in history where it, it's so bizarre to think about that it couldn't believe it if it wasn't written down. Yeah, it's, it, it's one of those instances of history where. A uh, great individual influences, you know, the turning of history. And you know, he would say, probably Cromwell would say, divine providence put him there. Oh yeah, um, definitely, and, and, and ensured what what happened happened. But I think why we rate him among the greatest generals, and, and someone who should be recognised as a great military commander, I, I would say is threefold. It's the courage and determination in battle. Hmm. It's his qualities as both a tactician and a strategist, but also like a leader of men, yeah, an inspirational leader of men. Um, but also, finally, it's his... He, he didn't just lead an army successfully and never lose a battle, um, but he built an army. You know, he played a huge role in building and organizing an army. Yeah. Um, and and putting in place the things that would make it successful in terms of training, discipline, organization, professionalism. And that was from the very start with the Ironsides, as we said, mm. um, and then obviously going in 
to the new model army. I mean, to find a man who has all those three qualities in general is very difficult. Um, especially the building an entire army part. That's kind <laughs> of the that's kind of the real shocker. Um, of course, that army, in a way, you know, lives on to this day. Yeah, it does, and it certainly does. And many of the aspects of it have, like we've said, turned into the modern British army. Yeah. I would say if, if if listeners are interested in, because, you know, it is a bit of a departure, I think, this topic from a lot of what we've done. Uh, a more interesting Cromwell, one of the great, um, I think, starting points, uh, it's just a mini kind of pocket biography um, by David Horsepool, part of Penguin's series on English monarchs, controversially. Mm. <laughs> Cromwell's in there. They have like these mini biographies of English monarchs. And it is a fantastic scholarly but highly readable kind of account. And if you want more about his personality, his beliefs, his politics, as well as his military career, um, that is a very cheap and easy starting point. Well, with that being said, I uh, and if you're interested in uh, maybe hearing some of your own ideas possibly discussed here on the program, then by all means, please email us, histories.most at gmail.com, uh, or follow us on Twitter or tweet us at Twitter at, uh, at historiesmost. And, uh, yeah, just send us any ideas, some comments. We had a few suggestions of other um, unlikely victories. Um, so it would be interesting to hear about um, other underrated generals from history, because I think our listeners, I'm sure, will have some suggestions. And perhaps one day, if we alternative ideas, what we could do is do a little, a little extra episode where we discuss some of them. Yeah, say, you know, alternative suggestions and person. cast our eye over them. Yeah, exactly. A fun idea for an episode. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to that. But for now, I've been Peter. And I've been Alex, and thank you for listening to History's Most. Mm-hmm.